Consider a city on the edge of the sea, at the rim of a nation dependent on the sea, on a continent surrounded by the waters of the sea, a mere island, as are all those minority parts of the planet we call the land. From here, at Nation's End, see the unending sea as a kind of symbolic road to distant responsibilities, distant friends and enemies, resources we must have to survive, let alone prosper. Consider the shore as somewhat more than just a beach, for it is, in fact, a dividing line for the two parts of the Earth, the only place in all the universe so divided for all we know to date. Talk no more of seven seas, but of one sea, indivisible, this single sea that rings the planet, that covers our world from northern ice to southern ice. The single sea, covering untold empires of mountain and canyon, of plain and desert. A home for living things, far more akin to us perhaps than life elsewhere, if any, out in space a treasure trove for vital resources, as we are just beginning to know. But one sea for all its swirls and roars, for all its restlessness, and yet, for all its nearness, a realm unto itself. Float over it, fly over it, move within it, wrapped in your old familiar atmosphere. Enjoy the hobbies, the sports, the diversions of it all. But before the immensity and the wonder of the sea, before all that it is that we do not know, we have but dipped our toes. To begin, at long last, to do more, to go further, men have begun to go down to the sea, not to cross it, not to play within it, but to dwell, to live for a while. Consider, for example, the Bermudan neighborhood of the sea. Here in Sea Lab One, four men lived and worked for 11 days at a depth of 193 feet. But how long can how many men work, live, and survive at how great a depth without coming? We do not know the limit yet. But now, it is a year later, and men are ready to extend the limits if they can. Here another adventure is in the readying stage another exploration into that hostile, alien place we call the sea. Here, within the sovereign waters of our America, the political frontier is but three miles from the shore, but the intellectual frontier is only a few feet below the waves. For we know so little about so much of our planet, which is the sea. This unknown empire that begins before our very eyes on every shore. Captain Lewis Melson commanding, along with George Bond, also a captain in the United States Navy and a doctor of medicine, now make ready for Sea Lab 2, one mile off the shore of La Jolla, California. Captain Zoni, commence flooding conning tower. What's our absolute pressure in Sea Lab? Uh, we have 44.1 pounds absolute. As Navy divers and riggers prepare to lower Sea Lab 2 to the bottom, 205 feet below, the question becomes, can men go even deeper, stay even longer, and work not only hard, but skillfully too? What indeed are the limits on flesh and blood beneath the waves? Never before Sea Lab One had men lived so long within the sea at such a depth. But to state a record is to state a challenge. That eternal American question, what next? If man need not return to the surface periodically, taking a long time to decompress those potentially fatal bubbles within his body, he can be infinitely more productive down below. But suddenly, a sea lab is being lowered. Command Van, we're losing pressure pretty fast. I uh, would imagine we have a leak here. We'll have a diver's check for a leak.
This was an unconventional kind of leak where the helium atmosphere inside the sea lab was being forced by its own pressure to escape. Capazoni divers report leaks at all port vents. Are we still losing gas rapidly? We're losing gas fairly rapidly. I think we could uh, probably stay ahead. Oh, very well. Diving station, let's continue to lower away. We can't stop, I repeat, we can't stop at 60 foot for check. We're losing gas, we have only 8,000 cubic feet of helium to get to the bottom. We must continue to lower away. It became a race. Get Sea Lab to the bottom right now, where the approximately equal pressures would keep the water out, the vital gases in. And so, 205 feet down, Capazoni Sea Lab on the bottom. Our pressure is holding at uh, about 102 pounds, absolute. Very well. The personnel transfer capsule, or PTC, goes down first. In case anything goes wrong in the Sea Lab capsule, the PTC, kept at the same pressure as the Sea Lab itself, will be the one refuge for the men. It will also be their elevator for the ride back to the surface when their stay is over 15 days later. Two other 10-man teams will follow this one, each to remain 15 days, excepting Scott Carpenter, however. The astronaut, who is to become an aquanaut, will remain below 30 consecutive days. Among the 10 men are a doctor, an engineer, and two oceanographers. Master Diver Price and Captain Walter Mazzoni, in charge of physiological and atmospheric control, witness the departure. The first team is to get the Sea Lab habitat operating, to explore the sea around it, to study marine life and the flow and temperature of the water, and to be in themselves human experiments in the physiology of man as he exists and labors within the sea. Down here, you can pay stiff prices for what would be small mistakes on the land or near the surface. While Wilbur Eaton rigged a lifeline to the sea lab, Commander Scott Carpenter, the team leader, enters through an open interface of water, held at bay by the equal pressures within the capsule. Diving station, aquanauts, Carpenter and Eaton have entered sea lab two. All right, Command Van, uh, the second aquanauts are getting dressed uh, and will be ready in about five minutes. And so, toward the end of August, the 45-day Sea Lab 2 experiment begins. The men go down into an opaque and murky bit of the ocean, far more typical of the ocean as a whole than those crystalline, technicolor, deep, soft Bermuda. Down they go, accompanied always, never alone. In deep sea diving, you owe your life, sooner or later, to the buddy system. Inside Sea Lab, you begin your life as an alien to this realm, by breathing an atmosphere of 80% helium, 16% nitrogen, and only 4% oxygen. For ordinary air would be a deadly gas mixture at these pressures of 100 pounds per square inch, seven times those of sea level. It is almost as if you were on another planet, though you are within the territorial waters of the United States. Aquanaut Carpenter exchanges greetings with astronaut Gordon Cooper, orbiting the Earth in Gemini 5, history's first chat between the bottom of the sea and outer space. Hello, Sea Lab. Good, how are you doing, Scott? Good to hear from you down there. I bet you're good, huh? Imagine now the routine of 45 days beneath the sea, exploring the cold depths where water temperatures range between 48 and 52 degrees, setting out lines to the underwater weather station, mapping the sea bottom, even taking a census of the fish, a kind of sample inventory of a future food supply for the proliferating human race. This offshore region of the ocean is known as the Continental Shelf, which hugs all the continents, an explorable realm three times the size of the United States for seafood and minerals.
a new realm for travel and rest, study and work. Today's fantasy turns out to be tomorrow's routine often enough. Already, if you take the fish eye view, the interlopers are making themselves at home. What is physiological normalcy at seven times the pressure of the land, breathing a strange gas mixture day after day? Dr. Sonnenberg, medico in residence, attending. Topside, Captains Bond and Mazzoni decide to have a look-see at their charges 205 feet down. Since they will be down only a short time, they will get off easy on the decompressing stopping every few feet on the way back up in the diving bell. A very cold 73 minutes coming up for the scant 13 minutes they are allowed on the bottom. It turns out that Captains Bond and Mazzoni intend to witness the re-enlistment swearing-in ceremony of Aquanaut Kaufman, proving that officers will sink to any depths to hold on to a good man. If you are a marine biologist, can you imagine a more ideal aquarium than the sea itself? to which you, too, at least for a while, belong? The cold black water was not an attractive medium for work, but in their early forays, the aquanauts managed to install the underwater weather station, a permanent emplacement. And so, from the shifting sands of the bottomland, from the force and direction of the internal waves, the sea will yield, in good time and bit by bit, a few of its mysteries. Man, too, has his mysteries, and he submits to frequent mathematical testing and even to electrocardiograms, both in and out of the water, as a constant check on his heart. The question always, what is normalcy under high pressure and a strange gas mixture? Supplies, mail, and newspapers come to you via United States Navy pressure pot, an exclusive service others may imitate, but never quite duplicate. Happy birthday, Dr. Sonnenberg, but it was your loving wife who was responsible, not the United States Navy pressure pot express service. Anyhow, you can't strike a match in a helium atmosphere. There just isn't enough oxygen to make it burn. Good place to kick the smoking habit. Whenever you exit for a look-see, bear in mind that the sea lab habitat is your compulsory home. You cannot just rise to the surface, emergency or not. Rapid decompression would kill you, and you must take care not to get lost in the dark waters. Among the hazards of the deep are the scorpion fish. The first aquanaut to be stung by one was Carpenter, who was hit on the right index finger, causing his arm to swell all the way up to the elbow. The pain was sharp and intense, but no matter how serious the wound, even if it were potentially fatal, you do not return to the surface. You are now an inhabitant of the sea until you decompress for 30 hours or more. Under Dr. Bond's topside instructions, Dr. Sonnenberg treated the wound, aided by special drugs stocked right in the sea lab. With three members of Team 2 already on board, the first team waits to depart, 15 days after sinkdown. His farewell to Carpenter, who will remain below another 15 days. The ascent will be a matter of a 54-minute elevator ride in the personnel transfer capsule, after which 31 hours in the deck decompression chamber will return the nine men to terrestrial status. You keep in touch with Topside by Electrowriter, and Topside keeps an eye on you, Big Brother-like, with its one-way television monitor, while the rest of Team 2 makes its way down what one of them called the longest 200 feet in the world.
Carpenter holds quarters with the members of the second team. He who had worked with the most sophisticated technology of our age in the prototypical space program contrasted it with the man in the sea program, which he called a newly legitimatized child represented by a nucleus of 50 dedicated men working with mail order equipment in marginal condition. But it is pioneers like these, members of this new establishment, the Descendancy, who are helping this newly legitimatized child grow up. Today's sonar, cupping its listening ear to the sounds of the deep, will give way to better, more sensitive, longer range sonar. And the current measurement device is but the progenitor of ocean-wide systems to chart the nature of the waters and the migration of marine life in terms of temperature and current. For all that, man is as a child down here. His basic motor skills cannot be taken for granted, nor can he depend much on his five senses in this cold, murky, top-heavy realm of water. You develop a certain gladness to be home again. Home, sweet helium breathing, crowded, celibate, teetotaling home, with its constant tests and measurements and checks. Relieved now and then by Papa Topside's folk symphony. How do you like that one? The Z Lab's own symphony comes complete with the curious sound that breathing helium imparts to the human voice. Into this ocean realm of mountains and canyons, plains and plateaux, who will play the role of St. Bernard Dog to aid those in distress? Who learned to come at once to an acoustic signal? Who learned to carry mail and a lifeline to a diver pretending to be lost? Who visited the aquanauts during their bottom land forays? Who but Tuffy the porpoise, first of the trained breed who may become man's best friend within the sea? Sunday was normally a day of comparative rest, a day made more meaningful by the Sea Lab prayer. Safeguarding care in all the many hours of their life under the sea. Give unusual wisdom to each of us topside who might somehow control their work and safety as they perform their duties below. And when their work and thy will together be done, grant us all a safe and worthy respite from our labors for a time to come. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thus did 30 days pass, a methodical and persistent sequence of work inside and outside the habitat, of catch-as-catch-can meals and housekeeping, of human measurement and evaluation under high pressure. Now the second team makes ready to depart, Scott Carpenter along with them, after their span of 15 days, his of 30, into the personnel transfer capsule. And, as medical wisdom has it, 33 hours of decompression on the support vessel in the deck decompression chamber. Decompression is the cross the divers bear. Meanwhile, the third team of 10 men prepares to depart for inner space. Led by master diver Robert Sheets, at 50, the oldest of the aquanauts. It's getting to be a kind of routine the almost inevitable destiny of things that seem fantastic at their very outset, whether it be a flight across the ocean or even a man in orbit. To make the far out an everyday affair is, after all, the prime purpose of all our technology. While he decompresses, Commander Carpenter has a phone chat, still in his helium voice, with his commander-in-chief. Take your watch, sir. Scott, do you read me or our... Yes, sir, Mr. President. Loud and clear. Fine. Well, Scott, I'm mighty glad to hear from you. You've convinced me and all the nation that whether you're going up or down, you have the courage and the skill to do a fine job. 
Then comes that happy moment when you become, except for your memories, like other men again, breathing in the natural atmosphere of Mother Earth. While down below, Dr. Sonnenberg, who has returned for a second 15-day stint, wrestles with that electrically heated diving suit that will permit three-hour journeys away from Sea Lab in comparative comfort. The prime objective of the third team was to try new underwater salvage techniques. Using a special foam, they raised barrels and an aircraft hulk from the bottom. With special torque-free tools, working on the explosive principle, they attached plates and lifting surfaces to part of a submarine hull. Older tools, like the spear and the fish hook, can be very useful too. You may not like sashimi, that Japanese delicacy roughly translated as raw fish, but frying is verboten down here. Hydrocarbon smoke doesn't mix well with helium in a delicate man-made atmosphere. This team and Team 2 made excursion dives to the rim of the underwater canyon, 266 feet below the surface. Master Diver Sheets, however, went with another man to the 300-foot mark, followed thereafter by other members of the team. Afterward, they dined on plankton, that floating microscopic life of the sea, saying it tasted like nuts. But always, you dive with another man not far away. The brief history of deep diving has proved time after time that the best of divers needs help desperately sooner or later. Equipment can fail and men can go astray in this pathless world. In the murk of the seafloor, you see a hint of the future mining by bottom coring, a miniaturized sample of what one day may be gigantic machines gathering minerals from the bottomland. Work to be done, where existence alone is a kind of triumph. Where the aquanauts discovered you could make brief dives 100 feet lower than Sea Lab and return to it without decompressing. This in itself is a bonus from nature. Forty-five days have passed since the first ten men came to live here, and now the time has come for anchors away, for men and hardware too. And the last swim toward the PTC elevator for the men of Sea Lab 2. Command van, the uh, Aquanauts report the lower hatch has been shut and dogged. They are standing by ready to come up. Uh, very well. Train operator, this is Command Van. PTC is ready for liftoff. Lift away. A crucial moment as the personnel transfer capsule breaks water. It contains ten men still under sea bottom pressure who must decompress slowly or die. A faulty valve, a leak, a single mistake of the many that are possible could turn the capsule into a coffin. As it is, the ancient art of rigging is not the least of the skills you need in this particular kind of oceanography. The mating of the personnel transfer capsule with the deck decompression chamber. Now begins the long wait. Decompression from 100 pounds per square inch to 14 and 7 tenths pounds per square inch. From 205 feet below to sea level. But at the 28 foot mark, Almost home, trouble, bad trouble. Uh, okay, Bob, uh, we've got the report on your uh, possible hit. Would you like to give me a rundown on it, please? Uh, yes, Captain. Uh, 
I have a pretty deep-seated pain in my right uh, leg. It started about an hour ago. It uh, started after right knee and has now progressed up to my hip. And uh, pain is increasing in intensity. I thought I'd better report to us as possible. Yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, week one, uh, let me check here, Ross. Uh, I think we better hold at 26 feet. Uh, I would recommend uh, that we put nine people into the outer lock, bring them up, run the corpsman in, and have uh, uh, have the inner lock brought on down to 60 feet and drive Bob on the uh, oxygen treatment table and see how it goes there and bring him up to that And so, from the outer lock in a quiet, tired moment, after the requisite 35 hours, Nine men emerged from decompression. It was not until more than 12 hours later that Bob Sheets emerged, free of pain and in good shape. Even the home away from home, a shell empty of men, is once more upon the surface, floatable elsewhere for another chapter in this ongoing adventure of man within the sea. Perhaps we shall see her again as Sea Lab 3. The commendations of today, the just pride for work well done, set the stage for the eternal question of all adventure, where do we go from here? Perhaps we will routinely send men to 800 feet soon, to 1,700 and more feet within some years, to live, to work, to study. A new world. Man looks to distant planets to plant his flag across the great bourne of lonely space, while at his very doorstep an unmeasured universe abides.